Hello bookworms! Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to have another list. I really love making those kind of videos and I have a feeling like I haven't done one in like a million years. So here we are again. Today I'm going to talk about 10 common misconceptions about books. That is 10 things most people get wrong about either specific books or genres or even readers sometimes. So before I get into it, it's really important for me to say that um, don't expect to be completely blown away from any of these entries. I think that most things in this list are kind of famous, especially if you're already interested in literature. Most likely you've heard at least some of these. So. I don't know, that's just my disclaimer here, but still, who knows, maybe you'll learn something new. So let's get into it, obviously in no particular order, but number one is that Frankenstein is a monster. When I say the word Frankenstein, do you automatically think of a very hideous monster-like man, probably green, with lots of scars on his face and bolts in his neck? Well, first off, like many other entries on this list, this is the fault of a movie. But also, in the original novel Frankenstein or The Modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley, we have a scientist called Dr. Victor Frankenstein who creates said monster but doesn't give him a name. Yes, Frankenstein is the scientist and the monster is usually referred to as Frankenstein's monster. Now, you can argue that the scientist himself, Dr. Frankenstein, is himself a monster since he knowingly created a living creature knowing that he will only live in, and suffer and hated by the world. But nonetheless, the monster that he created has no name and Frankenstein is the name of the scientist. Number two is that the Grimm brothers invented all the stories that we know today as the Grimm brothers fairy tale. Yakov and Wilhelm Grimm, also known as the Grimm brothers, brought to us many fairy tales that most of us grew up on, like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, Hansel and Gretel, Rapunzel, etc. But in fact, they didn't actually invent any of these stories. What they did was going around and writing down stories already existing but told orally from, you know, father to son or around the campfire or whatever. They deserve their credit since thanks to them we actually until today know all these stories, even though, and don't worry, I'll get to it, the stories that we know today are not always exactly like uh, they wrote it, but the fact is they just took stories already existing and putting them into paper and making sure that hundreds of years later we still know them today. So yes, they obviously deserve their credit for writing everything down, but they didn't in fact invent any of these stories, just wrote down stories that people already told for years before. Number three is a quote, elementary, my dear Watson, said by Sherlock Holmes. Much like Luke, I'm your father, or beam me up, Scotty, this is one very famous quote that was never actually said, at least not in the way that most people think it was said. Sherlock Holmes is one of the world's most famous characters, the famous detective invented by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, famous for stories like The Hounds of the Baskervilles, and endless of other uh, short stories that, if you remember, I cannot stand. So for this entry, I actually had the help of a friend of mine who actually really likes Sherlock Holmes. And she told me that Sherlock Holmes, the book character, never said the famous sentence, elementary, dear Watson. In one of the short stories, when Holmes is being asked, he answers elementary, but he never actually articulated the sentence the way we know it today. It's actually the movie version, at least one of them, that coined the sentence elementary dear Watson, but Sherlock Holmes, the original, the book character, never actually said the sentence. Number four is Dracula is the first vampire book. Dracula by Bram Stoker was written in 1894, if I remember correctly. It is the most famous vampire book ever written, one of the most famous books ever written. It's a staple in Victorian literature, in dark literature, and created one of the world's most famous, fantastic characters, and definitely deserve all that credit. 
However, it was not the first vampire book ever written. There are countless of other uh, vampire stories and novels, including one called Carmilla, which I really like. If you're interested with that sort of uh, literature, go check it out. But the first modern vampire story is actually kind of a funny story. Some of you may know how Frankenstein came to be. There was this party at the house of Lord Byron. He invited some guests, including poet Percy Shelley, his wife Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley's sister, I think, who was sleeping at the time with Lord Byron, but it's okay, everybody slept with Lord Byron in those days. And in addition, Lord Byron's physician, Dr. John Polidori. And in that night, they had this contest to see who can come up with the best story. That's when Mary Shelley came up with the story of Frankenstein and after a nightmare that she had. But also, this is when John Polidori came up with the first modern vampire story, which was actually a short story called The Vampire, which was published in 1819, if I remember correctly. But anyway, it was way before Bram Stoker wrote his Dracula, but nonetheless, I mean, Dracula became a lot more famous. I've never actually read The Vampire, so I can't comment on whether it's good or not, but it's a shame that with such uh, famous names like Lord, By Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley, not a lot of people remember John Polidori. Number five is most fairy tales end with they lived happily ever after. Okay, guys, remember how at the beginning I said that most of these entries are pretty famous? This is probably the most famous one, the most debunked misconception, that most fairy tales as we know them didn't really end in the Disney happy ending lived happily ever after, true love's kiss is the cure for everything sort of an ending. There is a ton of information out there about how the original fairy tales ending was. You can go and check it out online. I'm not going to go into all of them because there is a lot, but my favorite has to be the fact that the prince rapes Sleeping Beauty instead of kissing her in order to wake her up, and the fact that Ariel the Little Mermaid dies or turned into sea foam. Come on, she dies at the end. And the fact that the two evil stepsisters chop off parts of their feet in order to fit into the glass slipper in Cinderella. Fun. Now it's pretty obvious why the endings were changed to modern children because let's face it, Germans are kind of crazy when it comes to children's stories. But nonetheless, it's very interesting to see what the original were and what sort of drastic changes were made to fit into a modern audience. Number six. Now we need two hands and they don't fit into the screen. Comic books are for children. There are so many annoying stereotypes and misconceptions when it comes to comic books, graphic novels, and their readers. I'll try not to talk at too much length about it and keep it pretty concise, but even though there are tons of comic books out there suitable for children, and you know, it kind of makes sense because it's easier to read something with pictures and some kids are overwhelmed with a page filled with words, even though that's true, not all comic books are meant for children. There are, in fact, tons of comic books out there, whether they are about superheroes or not, that are way too dark or deep or complex or violent to be for kids. Even if we are just looking at superhero comic books, think of all the questions that they are raising about vigilante, about whether it's okay for a person who's outside the police force to punish bad people. Not to mention that some of these plot lines, yeah, they are about superheroes with fantastical superpowers and very shiny, colorful latex clothing. But some of these plot lines are really complex and deep and sometimes just so sad that are definitely not for kids. Moreover, there are a lot of comic books out there, especially graphic novels, that have nothing to do with these superheroes. Some of them are about real life struggles or some really horrific things. The most famous example must be Mouse, which is a graphic novel about the Holocaust. So let's just conclude. Just because a book has drawings in it doesn't automatically mean that it's only for children and people who love this genre aren't childish, necessarily. 
At number seven, we have another quote, to thine own self be true, William Shakespeare. Unlike the entry about the Sherlock Holmes quote, this is actually a correct quote. If you want to modernize it, it means be true to your own self. This is a really good quote, you know, be true to yourself, do what your heart tells you to do. And William Shakespeare is a really great guy to quote. So what's the problem? This one particularly irritates me because it all has to do with context. When you say to find oneself be true, William Shakespeare, you imply that William Shakespeare himself said said quote. Now, I obviously don't know personally Sir Bill, and he didn't really live in a time where you had a lot of interviews record what he said. But this quote specifically is from the play Hamlet, said by a character named Polonius. Now let's start with that. Just the fact that somebody else said it, and not specifically William Shakespeare, means that it doesn't necessarily mean that William Shakespeare believed in that quote. Now, I assume he did. I mean, like I said, it's a good quote. It's a good thing to tell, I don't know, young people. However, when you just say it like this, this is very problematic. I'll give you another example. Don't esquire, just do and die, Lord Alfred Tennyson. This is a part of a poem that he wrote about soldiers who just go into war and die without ever questioning what they're fighting for. You know, they don't ask why, they just die. However, this whole poem is very ironic and it actually means the opposite. But when you just quote it like this and say that whoever said it is Lord Alfred Tennyson in this example, you pretty much say that that's what he believed, which is the exact opposite in this example. Now let's go back to Shakespeare. I don't know how many of you have read Hamlet, but what happened in this quote is, like in the other example, ironic and pretty much the opposite. We have Polonius who talks to his son, Laertes, and there is a chance that I'm not pronouncing it correctly because I actually only read Hamlet. I didn't have the patience to sit through three hours of a movie with all due respect to Kenneth Branagh. So anyway, Polonius talks to his son who is about to go to school and he lectures him about how to dress, how to speak, with whom to speak, and how to act, how to do this and how to do this, and how to breathe. But at the end, be true to your own self. Do you understand the irony here? It kind of means the exact opposite. So when you take this quote and said William Shakespeare, you take it out of context. Now here it's actually a very nice thing because like I said, William Shakespeare is a good guy to quote and be true to your own self is a good sentence and it's a good quote and good thing to live by. But I'm really bothered and annoyed by this lack of context and just saying Quote William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare himself did not actually say it, you know, as far as we know. And in the play Hamlet, in case you're wondering, he did play, but he played Hamlet's uh, father, the ghost. So he didn't even play Polonius. This sentence was not said by William Shakespeare. It was said by a character with his own personality and agenda that might have been very different from William Shakespeare, the person that we said that said this quote. I hope that I made myself clear and why I do find that this quoting is kind of problematic. We're at number eight, and this one is that the ugly duckling is a children's story. I know I said that most of these things are pretty famous, but if there is one entry that I'm pretty sure most people will be surprised from, it's this one. Most of us know the story behind the ugly duckling by Hans Christian Andersen. We have the baby swan that's called a duckling. Is it accurate? Isn't a duckling only a baby duck? How do you call a baby swan? Whatever. Anyway, he's being born. He's very ugly. Everybody laughs at him. Nobody wants to be his friend. He's very depressed. He tries to find his luck in the world, but only runs into people or animals who doesn't like him because he's ugly. Until one day, he looks at his reflection in the pond and realizes that he grew into a beautiful swan. And from that moment, everybody wants to be his friend. Now think about it for a moment as a children's story. What does it tell our children? That it's wrong to judge people because of their looks, because someday they might be beautiful? What kind of a message is that? When you really think about it and think, hmm, you know, it really does sound like a strange children's story, 
That's because it's not. It wasn't ever meant to be a children's story. It's actually a satire meant for adults. I honestly don't remember most of the story, but I remember there is one group of, I think, swans or geese that are telling him, it's okay, you can join us and be a friend and be with us, just don't marry our daughters. Tell me that that doesn't sound like a say about our society and unfortunately one that's still relevant today. So yeah, the next time you tell your children the ugly duckling, really think about what this book is saying. It doesn't say anything good. It doesn't say don't look at the outside, look at the inside, because nobody does. The only reason that at the end the ugly duckling becomes acceptable is because his outside is changed. This is not the material and the punchline for a good children's story. This is a very good one for satire about us, our society. At number nine, the bard from Avon is back. And this one is that Shakespeare wrote for royalty. A lot of times when you talk about Shakespeare and Shakespeare's writing, you kind of picture some really high and mighty, fancy schmancy, or to those of you who did not grow up in a Jewish family, artsy fartsy sort of writing. We look at Shakespeare as something very high up there, very hard to read, and that might be true today, but the fact is that Shakespeare didn't write for royalty. In fact, he wrote for the masses, he wrote for the common people. The reason that today it might be a little harder to read is because the language that they spoke those days is different from the English that people today speak. But back in the day, a few hundreds of years ago, all the common people could go and see Shakespeare's play and actually understanding them. Quite frankly, there is a good reason why he's famous even until today. His content's just amazing. And if you haven't yet read anything by him because you're scared that the language is too difficult or something like that, just watch any of the film adaptations or maybe some modern adaptations. He really wrote about some really fantastic things that pretty much everyone can enjoy. Okay, guys, this is the last one. Are you ready? Number 10 is that science fiction is all about space battles, robots, and futuristic technology. Okay, granted, if you are reading about space battles, robots, or futuristic technology, most likely that you are reading science fiction. However, there is so much more to this huge, complex genre than this. Personally, I used to think that I hate science fiction because I thought all it is was, well, what I just mentioned. I saw Star Wars on TV, quite frankly. I never liked Star Wars. And I thought that this is what science fiction is, all about mindless action, explosions and chases and politics, which is always fun. But science fiction is, in fact, a very deep and philosophical genre. Even if you are looking about, like, the technology and aliens and spaceships and all of these things, they usually use this futuristic uh, setting in order to talk about our society. Think about a society of artificial intelligence robots and the question of, are they human? If they think they can feel pain, is it illegal to cause them pain? Or think about a society of aliens which wants to integrate with humans. How many movies have you seen where the people treat the aliens the way some human beings treat other human beings that are a minority or from a different race? And since I mentioned Star Wars that I don't really like, I think it's only fair to also mention one of my favorite shows ever, Star Trek, the next generation, which constantly talk about these sort of issues. You have an entire race of aliens who definitely represent the Nazis. You have another episode about a race of aliens that something that's going on with them is obviously a say about how we treat the LGBT society. Basically, science fiction as a genre uses other things in order to talk about more relevant things without actually mentioning them by name, giving us like a safe distance in order to look at our society. In addition, there is also another maybe subgenre or side to science fiction, which actually has nothing to do with technology. 
I am thinking of doing an entire video explaining exactly what is the science fiction genre, what exactly makes fantasy, fantasy, what's the difference between the two and the correlation. Uh, write down if you're interested to see it. I think I will do it anyway because I want to, even though just saying you don't have to know the exact definition of a work of fiction in order to enjoy it, but I do think it's interesting. But what I was saying is that there is another side of science fiction that has nothing to do with technology, a side which wants to show us our society the way it could be in the future, or it could have been if history would have gone into a different direction. We have a lot of dystopian futures. The most famous book in this genre is 1984, which does talk about a future. You know, it sets in 1984, but it was written in 48, which means that back then it was the future. And except a screen which can tell if you're looking at it or not, you don't really have a lot of futuristic technology in this book. However, the point is not a technology. The point is the society. And the book is kind of like, saying, look at us, if we'll continue to do this and that, that's where we're going to end up. Another famous examples are A Brave New World and Fahrenheit 451. And if you want a more modern example, The Hunger Games. The Hunger Games takes place in the future. Panem sets in what used to be the United States of America. And these books have nothing to do with futuristic technology. However, it does say something about our society. It is science fiction, just without a lot of science. But the point is, and I'm, I know that this entry was pretty long, but I have a lot to say, that science fiction is actually a great, complex, deep, philosophical genre which can have also a lot of fun action scenes and like funny robots and aliens and these sort of things, but it's a lot more than simply that. And that's it guys. Those were my 10 misconceptions about famous books. Click like if you like this video and of course, don't forget to write down which ones I forgot if you had others and also which one of these entries actually surprised you. I'm really interested to know. And uh, I don't know, like I said at the beginning, maybe you've learned something new. So thank you very much for watching this video. Don't forget to like and to subscribe to my channel if you dare and click on the little bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I'm uploading and check out my other videos which are probably right now are floating somewhere around my head and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.